Welcome to the Salt Strong Podcast, disrupting fishing entertainment as you know it. Prepare to laugh. Prepare to get to know fishing legends in a whole new and unfiltered way. And on occasion, you might even learn a thing or two about fishing. Here's your host, Joe Simons, like diamonds. All right, we are back. Joe Simons, like diamonds, salt strong, unchurched. And the last, I'm going to guess, 12, maybe even 14 episodes, I've been on my own. I've uh, I've had a few topics and they all come from questions. They all stem from things I'm hearing from either friends or, or people like yourself who are listening to the podcast. And um, I've got a good friend and my, my brother, Brant. And it's it, it's almost like it's tough to explain how timely his emails are. And I get a lot of emails and some I I don't care to remember. Right. And some hit me like, whoa, what what the heck did I just read? And it, the timeliness and, and these are prayers and in different parts of scripture that he sends. And a lot of times it's actually what I'm praying on. I haven't even shared that with, with you, Brent, but a lot of times it's stuff I'm actually praying on. And all of a sudden I'll get a message. It's almost like, oh, I think the answer is right in here. And, mm-hmm. and uh, it, it, it's just, I don't know. And, and I never really met you before, but it's just always been through, you know, through electronic communication. And I was like, wow. And clearly this guy knows his stuff. He has studied the scripture. He has spent a lot of time in the Bible, a lot of time discussing it and, and asking the same kind of questions that, that we all have and, and does not have all the answers. I, I will be up front and say, I don't think he has all the answers like, like none of us not. do, but, uh, but has more than me. And one thing I've always been interested in, and as soon as he talked about, or he mentioned a few different topics and uh, topics and one was Noah's Ark. And I was like, I've, I've always been so fascinated because, you know, as kids we, and it, it, even as adults, we love stories. And, and that's a memorable story. I, I would wager to guess most kids, even if they're not Christian, even if they weren't raised Christian, have heard that story or know bits and pieces of it. Uh, just a, a, a very amazing story. And obviously part of, of Genesis right there in the, in the Bible. But that's also, it, it, in just speaking candidly, probably one of the books that maybe gets picked on a little bit, right? By, Absolutely. by, by people who maybe say, all right, well, th- this is not true. Who wrote this? Like the, the, there's no way this stuff happened. It's, it's almost unbelievable. We got talking snakes and all these craziness happened in the book and these floods and the whole world. So you mentioned coming on to talk about Noah's Ark and I was like, that's it. Let's, let's do it. And uh, mm-hmm. so we're going to spend some time talking about that. I want you, if you don't mind, Brant, to do a little bit of background about yourself. I know you're a sheriff's deputy and now going kind of all in on a, a maybe something new and you got a book coming up. So kind of a, kind of give a brief little background about yourself. Absolutely. I appreciate you guys having me on Joe. I appreciate the salt strong community. Um, obviously I love getting the emails and the stuff from you guys too, man. It helps you get that hook into more fish more often, man. And that's, that's what we uh, do as fishing, man. We really love to get out there in God's creation and, uh, enjoy all the activities that he's, that he's given us. And, uh, yeah, I'm actually a retired deputy. Now I retired, uh, last year I worked as a deputy sheriff from 2004 to 2021 and, uh, had the opportunity to, to see a lot of stuff, to meet a lot of amazing people. And uh, still have these people as friends. Um, you know, me being a Christian man, I've, I've walked with the Lord now for about 35 years. And uh, like you said, when it comes to the answers and stuff like that, I, I don't have all the answers. I've got a very finite mind. Um, when you think about, it, you look around, you even looking around this room, you know, you know less about the room than what you know about it. You know, and and that's just the reality of the world we live in. There's so much happening. You know, even in the subatomic particle realm, if you get into that stuff, I mean, we can go on a lot of topics. But today, you know, I just really want to kind of keep it simple and uh, keep it to the point. Um, There's a lot of different avenues, a lot of different rabbit holes we could jump into and run for miles down. But I don't think that would really benefit anybody. Um, I'd like to kind of, uh, you know, start off by saying I I had an encounter um, and I kind of based this this little podcast discussion about this encounter I had a, a friend of mine who's still a friend of mine who was a deputy who happened to be a, a skeptic and uh which i love skeptics i love atheists i love people who challenge my faith i'm not a christian who who backs away from challenges i love to give thoughtful responses i love to be able to engage uh sincere questions obviously you got some trolls out there and stuff and i even love the trolls you know what i mean let's let's 
let's play under the bridge for a while if you want to. You know what I mean? But but so this this kid asked me one time, this guy, he was a Navy guy and he's he's a veteran and a awesome, awesome sheriff's deputy. I did a lot of work with him. We had each other's backs on a couple of different you know, occasions. And it was a, uh, it was good to know that he was, he was 10, eight, as we would say, it means in service. And, uh, so I'm going to leave his name out just because I don't like to drop names or anything like that with people. But he asked me one time when we were, um, hanging out, he said, do you actually believe in Noah's flood? Do you, you believe that that event took place? And I said, I absolutely do. And he goes, really? He goes, well, you don't seem like a dumb guy. I mean, I've known you. And I said, well, thanks, man. I appreciate that, man. You know, I, 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 I'm probably dumber than what you realize, but I, I like to think that I do like to think through, through things and, and, and have a, and be able to give a, a logical, reasonable response for, for as to what I believe and why I believe it. And uh, so this, this is going to be a, a discussion on the discussion I had with him that really uh, illuminated his eyes because he had these preconceived notions about the the flood account about Noah's Ark and and he had been taught these things possibly through professors at colleges through family members through friends but he had all these ideas in his mind about the flood and about the event that actually weren't in line with what scripture revelation was teaching us so when we sat down together and we began to discuss these things, the first thing I, I started out with was, uh, you know, I'm going to admit that this event is not just one of the uh, the type of event that you should just easily absorb. I mean, we're talking about a catas- uh, uh, just a catastrophe of, a, of the kind that we've never seen and maybe even in the movies. I mean, they're making movies where you see this stuff going on and we haven't lived through anything like that as people. So our experiencing some event like that is not real to us because we haven't really gone through something like that. But what I like to do is try to connect the event as it's given forth in scripture with the reality that we experience around us. So the one thing that people have trouble with is the first thing is, is why would God destroy anything at all? Why would he destroy anything at all? So doesn't God love creation? Doesn't he love people? And the answer to that question is obviously, absolutely yes. But he also hates evil. And I think a lot of us listening to this can understand that evil bothers us. You know, you see children being affected by evil. Our own selves have been affected. Me as a sheriff's deputy, I've seen evil in ways that a lot of people, unless you've been through that line of work or work that occupation, would never have experienced yourself. But in scripture, in this flood account, just to kind of kick this off, I think that the one thing that we need to realize is, is that that time period, the morality of humanity was at a low that we ourselves haven't even seen today. I know that when you watch the news and you see the stuff going on and you just see this evil, 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 the flashing lights every time you turn around of evil, 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 back then... It says that scripture, this is coming from scripture. It says that God looked on the earth and every thought and intention of the heart was only evil continuously. And I don't think that people can grasp, like, I'm going to try to put it in perspective here a little bit. So just imagine waking up in your neighborhood and you look at your neighbor and you know that they have no good intention towards you. Like no, none of your neighbors, you've got a hundred neighbors, right? And, and not one of them has a good intention towards you. As a matter of fact, they're thinking about how to manipulate you, how to steal from you, how to scam from you. They just want what you have and they're willing to do. There's no conscious level of, of resistance towards the evil they're willing to go to, to be able to get what they want or what they feel like they're entitled to. That's the kind of evil we're dealing with when we're talking about the conditions prior to God bringing judgment on the earth. So God's response is interesting in in scripture. It says that it grieved his heart to see humanity in this shape, because obviously, you know, when Jesus came, it said the angels declared peace on earth and goodwill towards them, towards those whom the Lord is pleased. Well, obviously during that time, there was nobody pleasing the Lord except for Noah. Noah found favor in the eyes of God and his family. And it's interesting because, you know, the Bible says the eyes of the Lord search to and fro across the earth, seeking for a heart that is fully devoted to him, that he may strongly support them. So I think that 
during that time, we're seeing that taking place where God is fully aware in his infinite understanding and his ability to see something that we can't see. Like you would never know your neighbor had those thoughts towards you until next thing you know, they're in your house trying to kidnap you. You know what I mean? Or something like that. That's the craziness we're talking about, you know? And, and, and so I think that, you know, the way I explained it to him was, is if, if somebody came to your house and your wife and daughter was in there and, and you were thinking to yourself, like, well, I'm surrounded by 20 maniacs that are trying to get in here and harm my daughter and my wife and, 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 and do who knows what, just nothing but evil. And all of a sudden fire drops out of nowhere and consumes these 20 people. Would you be angry about that? Would that anger you? Would you literally sit there and say, why did you do that, God? Or would you say to yourself, I'm, I'm glad that happened. You know, I mean, I mean, when you really look at those, the, the, the perspective, you know, if you've been the victim of evil, you know, unfortunately, with the free will of man, we see a lot more than what, you know, God's still grieved by evil to this day. But you're seeing that scenario played out prior to the flood. So what's God's response then? What's his response to, 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 to be? Is he's, you know, He sends Noah and the Bible says Noah was a preacher of righteousness. So Noah lived a life that was different from the rest. Noah's intentions and thoughts, though not a perfect man in terms of obviously all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, every one of us have, but he was different from the rest. His, his, his intentions and his thoughts towards God, he was friendly towards God. He was a friend of God and God took care of him. God hooked him up. And, and obviously God knowing what he was going to do to, to deal with this problem of evil. Um, the second thing that I think that we need to realize is, is that God doesn't work. I like to say he gives warning shots. OK, God's judgments all throughout Scripture are when you study Scripture, um, you'll see that he doesn't just put one center mass. He puts one outside your head, then he'll put one by your ear. He'll put one around you. And if you're still acting like evil, he'll go that direction. Then the, the final is center mass and he'll take you out. All right. So we're seeing that we, we actually have a time period that Scripture gives us of 120 years. 120 years of Noah preaching righteousness and these people just laughing, scoffing, because there was no big rainstorm at the time. So the thought of flood, the thought of this water was insane to these people. He was a conspiracy theorist, you know, at the time, like, oh, yeah, it's going to whatever. Noah, what what are you doing? You know, that kind of thing. I mean, you could just hear the jeering and the mocking and and everything going on and the crowds just gathering around, scoffing at him. And uh, Noah just stayed with it. And um uh, Obviously, I think that um, I got some notes here I'd like to, to kind of go over just just to just to kind of keep us on pace here, yeah. um, not to waste anybody's time. Um, so we talked about the total wickedness and waywardness of humanity uh, that, that, that we've discussed. And we've also talked about the amazing, amazing patience of a loving and perfect creator. I mean, like I said, again, that's a patient, patient creator. How many dads could stand there? For 120 years, if you could live that long and watch their child rebel, 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 and you give warning, warning, warning without taking them out. I mean, I see parents all the time, you know, the kid opens up their mouth once and they've had it. It's over. You know what I mean? You know, the parental hand comes down on them and it's like, that's it, kid, you're done. Dad or mom's shutting you down, kiddo, you know, but God's loving hand, he's very patient, not wanting any to perish. You know, that's not God's intentions towards humanity. And if you think that's the case and you're listening to this you have the wrong God in your mind. You really do. You have the wrong God. It's not the God of the Bible that you're looking at. You're looking at some sort of a figment of your imagination or some sort of figment that somebody else has put into your mind that's not consistent with Scripture. I could take you through, we're not going to, but I could take you through all the judgments of the Bible and demonstrate God's patience. He's the same yesterday, today, forevermore. So how he responds once is how he'll respond again and again and again. It's always perfectly. It's always timely. There's always patience, love involved, but also hatred of evil exists in his heart and in his mind. And that's why he deals with that the way he does. So one of the things, too, that 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 uh, my buddy was talking about was the, the the vessel itself, us being fishermen. I mean, I own a boat. I know you guys own a boat and probably a lot of listeners own vessels and vessels are awesome. man. they, they allow us to to see things, do things and catch fish that nobody else can. And uh, but the one thing I want to key in on now is, is was this vessel a seaworthy vessel? OK, and I want to go over some dimensions here just to put things in perspective. So, so 
when God gives the command, the first thing that we would we would ask is, is all right, where do these schematics come from? Where, where, where do the, the the blueprint for this vessel come from? You know, it's not like there's a West Marine down the road. It's not like there's a YouTube video where you could just you know, Noah's on his computer and pop how to build an ark. Well, nobody's built one before. I can't, it just, the search comes up empty because there's nothing there, you know? So, so you ask yourself the question, well, what did this vessel actually look like? All right. And, and, and in fact, it, we, we have the dimensions. Scripture gives us the dimensions in cubits, and I'm just going to translate them. A cubit is about 18 inches, uh, depending on, you know, the, the, the historical text that you read. So it's right around 18 inches, uh, give or take. So, this vessel was actually over 500 foot long, 86 foot wide, and had three different levels to it, right? So when you look at a super tanker, um, I was out dolphin fishing and doing some sword fishing with my brother off the Keys. And I remember during the uh, the shipping lanes, right, there was this massive super tanker that would come by. And you're just looking at that thing and you're like, man, that thing is just awesome. It just disperses so much water. And it's, it's really a sight to behold, you know? So, so this, this arc actually was looking like a super tanker. So if you were to fly a, a drone over the, the event of the flood, you would look down and be like, what is that massive vessel doing down there? All right. And, and as a matter of fact, some people have actually tried to put it in the boxcar scenario. So you would look at approximately 750 boxcars worth of shipping capacity. That's a lot of boxcars, about 750 and then you're looking at, you know, you're looking at eight people. Okay. So you're not looking at 800 people. You're looking at eight people, Noah's wife and his, and his sons and, and their, and, and their wives. Right. And then, and then you're also looking at the fact that some people like to scoff and mock, like, how could you fit all these animals on the boat? And I'm saying, well, now that we know about genetics, we know that all dogs come from the wolf. Okay. We all dogs. The wolf is the original family of a kind of, of that, that all dogs genetically come from, right? So I got a couple little stinkers here in the house, and I look at you and I say, You're far from a wolf. You know, I love you, but you're far from a wolf, you know? So, but that's just the dog kind, right? So you don't need, you know, uh, 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 every kind of species of dog, a poodle and, a, you know, a Jack Russell. That's not what you need. That's not how genetics works. And we know that nowadays, so we can kind of go back and say, you know, well, there's there's only a certain amount of kinds. There's a two by two. There's male and female. He's not 25 of this, 30 of that. We're talking about a reasonable amount of number of, of animals here that's sufficient for the job of repopulation of the earth, right? And uh, some people also approach the uh, the fact that, you know, how could you, you know, you look at this vessel here and, and could it float, right? So, so. Obviously, we looked at the dimensions, we looked at the size, very impressive. It's nothing to scoff at or mock at, in my opinion, at least. I look at it, I think mean, if it was a 32-foot yellowfin that they hopped on, I'd be like, yeah, I don't believe that story. I'm bugging out on this one. I'm checking out because there's no reason and logic behind that at all, right? But an interesting thing took place. The, um, the Navy actually made a small-scale model of this vessel, and they tested it in one of their test tanks and they concluded that this vessel could withstand waves up to 200 feet and pitch and yaw 90 degrees and it naturally pr propelled itself bow first into waves wow this is their conclusion and this obviously are people that are friendly towards christianity friendly towards the bible um, these are people that some of them could have been but these these are just scientific results this is what they've discovered you know, about this vessel. And we know that um, it was mind blowing because we, we know that there's basically six degrees of freedom that any vessel can operate within, you know, the heaving, the swaying, the surging, the yawing, the rolling and the pitching, right? Well, this thing had it all. It had it all. And it wasn't designed to be a speedboat. No one wasn't entering any sort of a speedboat race or anything like that. He was, he was keep the keep the family alive, keep yeah. the animals alive, it's right? Survival race. <laughs> survival race it was absolutely the ultimate survival race right i mean that's the you know there, there's a lot of uh ancient cultures that you say that joe that they call it the boat that saved mankind even china has a, a a flood story a lot of cultures have these flood stories and 
And, and there's actually little symbols that called the mouth of eight is what it reads in Chinese. And obviously there's eight people on the boat. So we're not talk we're talking about something that's that's known throughout cultures for generations and generations, the event. Um, but I think too, uh, one of the things I like to discuss here is the is the the reasonable nature of the numbers. The numbers make sense uh, to me. They're not fanciful, but they're reasonable. Um, other flood accounts carry with them a more fanciful storyline. And and what I mean is, is when you start to study other culture uh, flood accounts, which I've done through the years, you see mystical creatures showing up. You see storylines of like multiple gods fighting, wanting to have uh, their way with humanity. One disagrees with how man, humans should be treated and handled. So you see some stuff in, in, in these storylines that would cause, you know, people that, that may uh, be skeptical to give them more of a reason to be skeptical, uh, skeptical because they just don't find that to be a, a reasonable position to stand on. And I personally, not knocking any of the other cultural beliefs, um, I'm not doing that in any way, but I, I, I can agree with that, that it, you know, that I don't think as a Christian, God asks me to, 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 believe anything that doesn't have some sort of a substantiation of reason and logic to, to back it up. You know, I mean, after all, there is a passage in scripture in Isaiah that God himself says, come, let us reason together. Though your sins are as red as scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. And you would think for yourself, at least I think in terms of like our creator, you have an infinite intellect who created our infinite, our finite intellects. You know, so why would he want us as a perfect intellect to have to establish our faith on something that's shaky, you know, especially with Jesus's own words saying that, you know, he who builds his life on my teachings is like someone who builds their life on a rock. You know, the storms come, the waves come, and obviously the house stands, but you, you go your own way and you try to use your own wisdom. It's like in your house on the sand. And the storms come and they just, next thing you know, your life's imploding. And, and I want to say this real quick, Joe. I want to say that if you're listening to this podcast and you're at that point in life where you're wondering, you know, maybe your life is in that position of implosion and you've, and you've thought to yourself, you know, man, I, I just thought things would turn out differently. You know, I look at the economy. I look at everything going on with, with our land. Well, guess what? God's, God, God, God's economy is economy proof, okay? He, he's not affected by... The, the things of man, you know, he doesn't look at those things because he's the owner of a cattle on a thousand hills. So I just want to tell you that you are loved, um, that God does want you to be in a position of freedom in your life. I do want to let you know that the word of God is perfect wisdom for your life. And when you do follow the pathway that God has sent for us, uh, set before us in the person of Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean trials and tribulations aren't going to come. It's how you handle them. You know, and, and and that wisdom can allow uh, allow us to actually avoid a lot of stupid stuff we get ourselves into as well. I know I can speak that to myself. I can always look back through my life and say, "Well, that was a really dumb thing." And I look at the Bible, and I'm like, "Well, yeah, the Bible said don't do that to begin with, right?" So I'm like, "Well, if I wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't have been in that dumb situation, right?" And I can personally attest to that because I do stupid stuff all the time. You know, that's one of my prayers, Joe. Is is I wake up, Lord, don't let me be an idiot and keep me away from idiots. You know, that's, that's as simple as my life I try to keep, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and, it, and but first it's me. Jesus said, take the, take the log out of your own eye before you try removing the speck out of your brothers. Right. Mm. So, so we have this storyline here and I, I want to touch now on the rain. We're coming into rainy season here in Southwest Florida and where you guys are at up there in Winter Haven in Tampa. And, and we see massive amounts of rainfall, but but the rain that we're talking about here, something that 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 would that would kind of man, it's hard. It is really is hard to imagine the whole world being covered by water, even up to the highest mountains. That is hard for the mind to conceive. But but they actually have found sea life on the tops of mountains. <laughs> they found sea life on, on mountain tops, which is obviously something that maybe would cause an eyebrow to kind of you know raise up a little bit, mm -hmm. just because how did it get up there? You know, and we're not talking about three or four shells that birds could have flew up there and dropped, and we're talking about a massive amount of of evidence, and it's and it's worldwide. It's not just in certain locations and stuff like that, but um. So the, the scripture says it rained 40 days and it was 40 nights. We're talking about a, an amount of water that bursts forth from up above and from below. And when you look at the ocean floor now, 
and this is how my mind works. If, if I looked at the, you know, we have these abilities now to, to, to check out the ocean floor, a lot of the ocean floor, and there's a lot of cool stuff hanging out down there. Um, if, if we looked at the ocean floor and there was no act, uh, a measurable or, or detectable activity of, of a splitting of, the, of the, the ocean floor at all, I would say that, you know, well, it could still be true, but it's harder to believe when that evidence isn't there. But we actually have detected that all around the globe, throughout the oceans, there's like these baseball seams that just kind of run, and we got water coming up from those seams. And 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 this is something that's that's you can you can research and you can look into. And I would challenge you, you know, and, and encourage you to to look into that. But we do see these these massive amounts of of this this cutting through of the ocean where it split forth, the splitting forth of the ocean. And um, and then also too, I would like to say when it comes to the forty night, the, the water coming down from above, um, the environment that we see today was not the environment that they knew back then. Um, people talk about long lives. People talk about oh, Loma lived six hundred years, six hundred fifty. So so, and they like to scoff at that too. And I would say, well, you know, they've they've recently been finding um, some certain discoveries in the fossil records and uh, even in amber and stuff that that really demonstrates that what they were experiencing them in terms of the atmospheric conditions are far, far different from what we are actually looking at today. Um, there was a dragonfly that had like a three foot wingspan. Well, dragonflies, the way they fly is they move off of oxygen and um, in the atmosphere. And, 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 and the one thing is, as you look at a bug like that, I mean, hitting your windshield, you're done. You're a goner. Imagine a three foot. <laughs> I just can't even imagine, but they found that, right? So with the, with the knowing how a dragonfly operates within the, within the, within the world, you know, the, the current level of oxygen couldn't, that thing couldn't get off the ground. Okay. There's no way that thing could even get off the ground. So that kind of points to the fact that the, there was a greater level of oxygen back then, um, and we actually have amber that they were able to take oxygen bubbles out of that show a greater concentration, a greater percentage of oxygen in those amber uh, pieces of amber where they were able to extract. And this is all you can look it up. I mean, this is stuff that you could actually look up on YouTube. You can do your own research. I always don't take my word for anything. I want you guys to go out there and and uh, my word is not the gospel. I'm just throwing information out there to to make you think a little bit, to challenge maybe a presupposition you've had. And uh, ultimately, to to demonstrate why I believe, you know, the flood story, the the Noah's Ark story, was an actual event, and it's reasonably and logically explainable, pertaining to what we know about reality and, and the just current discoveries around us. But one might ask the question: um, What would cause our atmosphere to shift in such a way that lifespan shortens, and animals like that, even dinosaurs, you know, they have the little bitty teeny nostrils, you know, and you watch this massive creature this breathing out of like a McDonald's straw. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like you look at that, you know, it's like, well, how did that thing breathe? I mean, obviously we know the higher we go, the less oxygen we have. And, and that big massive tanker body that it had, I just getting enough oxygen to be able to maneuver the way it did and to be able to survive and thrive is something that it couldn't do today. So we asked the question of what happened in, in the, in from that period of time. And some people would say, oh, an asteroid hit or whatever, which, which fine. If you want to believe that stuff, I'm not going to sit there and judge, but there are other alternatives too, that fit this, that fit the evidence. Right. So, so when you're looking at that massive, uh, uh, flood scenario, you're seeing water from above. And, and I would argue that in my mind, I could see the fact that our ozone layer, it, it protects us from the sun, the UV rays, it protects us from a lot of the stuff that causes, the second law of thermodynamics to be enhanced, you know? And uh, once that leaves, obviously you get a lesser protection and you get that second law of thermodynamics um, enhancing and kind of, you know, things run to disorder at maybe a a little bit more rapid pace just because of that protection is gone. And that's just one scenario. I'm not saying that's what happened. I'm saying that that is a very plausible and reasonable explanation concerning what we're finding in terms of the current fossil records and the current stuff that's pointing to a greater um, atmospheric condition being present, allowing for the long lifespans that we see. And they've also called, too, they found uh, these, these skulls. They call them Neanderthal skulls. 
And um, they say that that's our species, which I wish we could do another thing on that whole thing itself. But but the thing is, is when you look at these skulls, which I've studied and observed them, they've got a massive eyebrow. Like their eyebrows are like, like, like literally, like you, I don't know if you've ever seen an old man before and you look and he's a little bit older and you look at his eyebrow and you're like, that dude, you could have a couple of birds land up there, you know what I mean? And chill out for the day and mm. it would just be cool for them, right? Well, because that, that area keeps growing, right, through, through the lifespan. So these skulls are very interesting because that's, they're, they're thicker. They got massive, massive bone uh, structure uh, increase around the, uh, around the eye. And also too, the wisdom teeth fit. The wisdom teeth fit. So, so, you know, a lot of people have their wisdom teeth pulled. So I also see that as being something that kind of points towards man being more of a tank back then. And we're more of a Volvo now. You know what I mean? I think man was much, much stronger and bigger and badder and better, which accounts for, you know, Noah and his sons being able to build, build that vessel, you know, and then they had 120 years to do it. There wasn't like there was 120 days, you know what I mean? Or 120 hours. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the numbers fit in terms of reason and, and logic, you know, and, and the same thing goes with the, uh, with the rain, you know, it wasn't, wasn't four days or 40 hours, you know, it was 40 days and 40 nights of hard rain. It rained here the other night. I look out in an area where the kids were playing uh, soccer the other day. And that place was a pond, you know, you could put some bass out there, you know, and then the next day it was gone, but it filled up three feet, you know, cause we had four inches of rain in a matter of a couple of hours. So you could just multiply that times that time period and you can get and and it's just coming down from above. That's not coming. And the ground was saturated too. You know, it wasn't saturated. It was, it was uh, dry. So the water went down, but you're looking at a scenario that, you know, people like we were talking about earlier before we started, how some of this stuff may be hard for people to understand because they don't live in an environment where they see what rain can do via a hurricane, via these storms and how much rain can be dumped out. You guys see it. We see it. Mm-hmm. And uh, it could be somebody, something more challenging to believe in, in an environment like an arid environment, like a desert or something like that that just doesn't, you know, get the rain. So one of the things, too, here to, to kind of wrap it up and sum it up is, is you know, the overall time period on that vessel was a total of about 377 days or 12 months and, and 17 days. And it wasn't just a few days or a few hours. You know, it just it's one another another one of those scenarios where the numbers just fit. You know, so so my point in, in bringing this up is, is when I start to talk um, about Noah's flood, like I did my friend, I know he's a reasonable guy. I know he's a logical guy. He's he's done investigations just like I have. So there's nothing in this account in terms of like the number numbers that are given that throws up a red flag that makes it completely inconsistent with what we can observe around us. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. So, so I would say if somebody is a skeptic, I would say, you know, here's another thing I would, I, I would, I would say, you know, I've been to college campuses. I've, I've seen, some some kids get pretty aggressive towards Christianity and professors even and stuff and personally attacked and and you know we don't do that as Christians at least I I don't do that you know the Bible talks about let your speech be seasoned with salt and full of grace you know grace is good grace is a good thing it's what it's what we all have as Christians we live under that grace that God mm-hmm. gives us freely gives us and uh, we love every bit of it and where sin increases grace increases <laughs> that's an amazing thing you know serve a very loving Creator. But I would say, you know, I, I would challenge the person, and I've challenged some of my friends uh, to this. Why do you respond to the Bible differently than any other book? Um, it's something that's been a curiosity for me to kind of watch people's reactions when I just bring up scripture or bring up a passage. Um, one one way I can put it, maybe a scenario that that might make sense to people is 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 if I had a plastic snake in front of me and and I threw it at you, and you knew it was a plastic snake, you would probably just catch it and laugh at me and say, hey, nice try. You didn't fool me there, kid. But what I see happening is, is these, these types of individuals who are very aggressive towards Christianity, they talk about Christianity like it's a plastic snake, but they respond to it like it's a real rattlesnake. That's a good analogy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like they're threatened. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, they act like it's not a big deal, but then they respond like it's a really big deal. And um, 
And, and that's something that I, because my whole heart here is is ultimately to get you into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father, but through me. Um, if you're on here and you're listening and maybe you're in college and you're having challenges with your professor, you know, there's there's some professors out there that are kind of aggressive. I had a couple that, that I experienced, you know, and you just got to maintain your composure and coolness, you know, and, and love them. And, um, but one thing that, you know, you get here, you can't know the truth. And obviously there's a simple way to defeat that. You just ask them if that's true. Self-defeating is what it is. If you say you can't know the truth, you're actually saying it's true. You can't know the truth, which is a truth, which is called a self-defeating statement in philosophy. Okay. So, so, so that's the way God set up the intellectual battlefield, so to speak. You can't escape truth. You can try to ignore it. You can try to distort, create your own delusional reality outside of scripture. But ultimately, when it comes down to it, you know, the intellectual battlefield that God has set up for us puts us at an advantage in terms of our argumentation, because those kind of statements, you can't know truth. You can't like, like, you know, well, is that true? You can't know truth. You see how that works? You're saying it's true, you can't know truth, which is a truth. That's a self-defeating statement, right? So these kind of statements, you know, when they come out, it makes people laugh like you're laughing now, Joe, because it does. But but I think this is an example, Joe, of, of, of what the scripture has to say when when it says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And, and, and that's not me speaking. Those are words from God, right? So God looks at a person that doesn't believe in him and said, that's a foolish statement to say there is no God. God doesn't mind skeptics. Jesus loved, you know, uh, uh, the doubting Thomas and, and gave him the evidence he needed to, to believe because he wasn't, you know, antagonistic, hateful towards Christianity. He just wanted some reasons to believe that were solid, man. You know, you can't blame the guy for that. I never blame somebody for wanting solid, reasonable evidence to stand on for the, with, with their faith. I myself have spent my whole lifetime, you know what I mean, devoted to to, to answering tough questions. Like I said, I love tough questions, man, because it just toughens me up, man. It toughens my faith up. And and what is the book on, if you don't mind sharing? The book that I'm coming out with, mm-hmm. um, it's actually a, a, a book that's going to be on the Godhead, is what it is. And um, it's going to be called The Eternal Godhead of Love and Revisiting the Doctrine of the Trinity. And it's going to be discussing the traditional understanding of the Godhead as set forth by Augustine, um, three persons in one. And we're going to be discussing that and we're going to be getting into detail about the um, like, like, is that a way that scripture backs up? And I'm not saying here, and I don't want anybody to take this out of context here, because I'm not saying that I, uh, the Trinitarian belief in God is a heretical belief. I'm not saying that at all. What this book does is, and and, and, I, and I'm not going to give too much away here because we can maybe do another segment, you know, once things come out, it would be cool to be able to help people. But it's a book that I've done 20 years of research on. Wow. And I like reasonable, logical explanations, as you can tell through this, through this meeting here that we've had with this podcast. And um, so, so the book's going to be discussing God's nature as a being, how we are created in his image and likeness what that means. And one simple way we can, I like to say in the book, what I say is, is this, we are created by a God who is loving fellowship for the purpose of being able to have the free opportunity to enter into fellowship with the father and the son through their spirit. Okay. So, so the book is talking about how what it means to be created in the image and likeness of God and why God created us for the purpose of fellowship and what that fellowship with God does. Jesus said, you know, when you, you'll search for me, you'll find me, you'll seek me and find me when you seek for me with all of your heart. And when, when people want to have a relationship with God, he said, the father and I will reveal ourselves to them. Right. So one little tidbit here that I'll throw out here, just a little uh, teaser uh, that I like to throw out is is some people ask, well, why does God have to be a being of fellowship? Well, there's a very simple response to that, and I'm going to reason it out for you real quick. So if God was not in fellowship, God would have to thereby create a being to have fellowship with, which would make him be dependent upon the fellowship of the being that he created. That would be no God of Scripture. 
Okay. Good. So, 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 so the God that we serve is eternally fellowship. He's not dependent upon his creation for anything. He says that over and over again. He created us as beings that are not in eternal fellowship. We are created beings. We are created with the ability. We have a heart, which is in the Greek, cardia, which is where we get our word cardiac from. We have a spirit, which in the Greek is pneuma, where we get our word pneumatic from, and pneumonia. In the, in the Hebrew, it's rock, which means breath. Okay. We also have a mind or, or we, we have a, a soul. So all these things, if you look at scripture, what I've done in this book, Joe, is, is I have taken every single passage where these words are found from Genesis to Revelation and thoroughly analyzed them and compartmentalized them to be able to create the picture that God's creating for us in terms of what this means. Because I always like to say that if you miss one passage of scripture, it, it, it limits your ability to rightly divide the, the scripture, and then thereby it hinders your ability to, to get the picture that God's creating through his word. So it's like a piece of a puzzle. You can have 5,000 pieces to a puzzle, and, and, and you miss one. That one little piece could determine the complete how that puzzle's viewed. There could be a little person there doing something that could determine the outcome of, you know, could completely change your view of the way you view that puzzle. So that's why it's important uh, uh, I'm a big Calvary Chapel guy. I love Calvary Chapel, the Calvary Chapel movement. It's not denominational, um, but but that's one of the things we focus on is teaching the Word of God, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And I would even go so far to say word by word, as Jesus said, every jot and every tittle, you know what I mean, is 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 will not pass away. You know, the Word of God cannot be broken. And we see people trying to break it, but they end up breaking themselves on it, you know, but it's still here. You know, it's still here. It's it's like I, I that's one of the things that's like, where do you think the word of God's going? We've had generation after generation of humans coming on this earth, attacking this book with everything they got, all the firepower they can muster up, and it's still here. Yep. They're not, but it is. <laughs> that's and that's good. something big. You know what I mean? That's something big in my mind. And it's like, you know, I've I've studied the scholars of the past, you know, Frederick Nietzsche with the God is Dead movement, Immanuel Kant. You know, I've studied these guys, you know, and these philosophers, and and I even had a little girl um talk about uh she was a, a philosophy student at the college down the road, and she's like, I've been studying, you know, Frederick Nietzsche, and 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 I'm like, Oh yeah, are you familiar? I said, Yeah, I'm familiar. And she's like, I really kind of I'm digging some of his stuff. I'm like, Well, cool. I'm like, so you you want to end up committing suicide? Is that what you want to do with your life? She looks at me, well, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, that's what he did. I'm like, so if you follow the same ideologies that this man, it, to me, it logically leads to the conclusion that, you know, God is dead. Life is meaningless. Let's just, you know, case sera, sera. Why even breathe another breath? You know? Ouch. Yeah. You know, but, 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 it, but it's all done in love, though, you know, because ultimately, you know, I see somebody and I say, you know, the truth does set us free, you know, and, and, and uh, I had another little girl in the gym who, uh, at one of the gyms, she, she comes up to me, real sweet little girl. She says to me, she says, you know, these professors are trying to tell me everything that life's about. And I said, well, that's, that's what a professor's job is. You know what I mean? They're trying to give their understanding and their view of what they think life's about. She goes, but it's confusing me. And I said, well, Christianity is not confusing. I said, God didn't make it confusing. She goes, well, how, how, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, let me ask you a question here. How many thoughts can you think at one time? One, how many words can you speak at one time? One, how many names does God give us to call on for salvation? One, he works in ones. It's good. Right? So, so, so my point is, is that the problem is, is what I see, Joe, is, is knowledge, the Bible says, puffs up. Right. Knowledge can probably it just it puffs up, but love builds up. OK, so I think that as Christians, even with this study we've just done, you know, I, I don't like attacking. Um, I don't like being attacked. Uh, Jesus said, do unto others as you would have doing to you, know, do you. I mean, it's like if you don't want to be attacked, don't attack somebody, you know. And I think, too, that that when you start to understand that that. God's love, that's a prayer that I pray over everybody listening is, is that if you already know God's love, that you would experience that on a deeper level and a more meaningful level. 
And if you don't know God's love, I would pray that you look at the cross and you look at a man who hung there and bled. And uh, he was an innocent man. Um, They couldn't charge him with any sin. Um, They couldn't charge him with any crime in terms of from a, a legal perspective. They went with blasphemy, but he was just he was testifying what the father told him to say, you know, so all the words were spoken to the father. He said, these words I speak to you are not my own, but the one who sent me gave me these words to tell you. So he was just telling the truth and got murdered for it, hung on a cross. And before he, he, he went, he made sure his disciples understood exactly what he was going to do. He said, you know, there's no greater love than for a friend to, to lay down his life for another. Right. And he goes, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. Right. So, so. I, I, I want you to know that there is a real God out there and he really does love you and he really has created you not to live a life of captivity, but a life of freedom, a life where you can have a marriage, a life where you can have a family that honors him and loves him and children that are raised in the fear of the Lord. And, and, and you have this awesome creator who's constantly reaching out through the creation to us through myself through joe through a lot of different people and i think that's why i love the the unchurched program here in joe's heart and salt strong's heart is because you know we're not these basher men you know what i mean we we really do care we do care we honestly sincerely care about you as a person no matter what you're going through you know the encouragement i pray encouragement over your life and that's the, the message that I really want to get across is, is we can talk about all this cool stuff with Noah's Ark and the flood, but it means nothing to somebody who just went through a loss of a family member who's sitting there contemplating suicide or who's going through the challenge of some wrestling with some sort of addiction or something. This material means nothing to them. Mm. It means nothing to them. What means something to them is knowing that someone loves them and they are valuable. And they are created for the purpose of fellowship. That's, good. that's what means something to them. And that's why I don't want to let this intellectual talk um, get so intellectual that we lose sight of hurting people and what is actually going to heal a hurting heart. And I've experienced in my own life, I've watched it happen in countless deputies' lives. I've watched it happen time and time and time again. And that's where my confidence comes from, Joe. It comes from... From the fact that I have watched in my life this invisible God do things within my invisible thinking realm and within my invisible spiritual self that are beyond what words can express. And Jesus is who he says he is, and he does what he says he's going to do when you believe him. He will set you free. I promise you that. He says, I will by no means turn away any who come to me. But you got to go to him. He doesn't snatch you and drag you into a relationship with him. You know, and it's so simple. Once you understand in God's spirit, and maybe you're listening right now and you're thinking, man, I just feel something weird going on in my heart, right? And, and, and that's not something weird going on in your heart. What that is, is, is God through his spirit. It's bringing the reality of we ourselves being sinners and we ourselves having offended God. And you bring up the breaking of the Ten Commandments. And, and, and that's called conviction is what that's called. It's, it's a conviction thing. And, and that's what we do, convicting the world of unrighteousness. That's what the Spirit does. And God does that through His Spirit, through the testimony of Scripture and through the testimony of His servants. This one, we're His servants. So I would say that, that you're experiencing that. And, and, and you may think, well, what do I do now? Is as Well, Scripture says that you... You believe on the Lord Jesus, the name of the Lord, and you'll be saved, right? So there's no other name. Uh, Jesus Christ is not the spirit brother of Lucifer. He's not, you know, some sort of figment. He is actually the son of God, and he's the son of man. Um, Thomas testified to that, my Lord and my God. Uh, We could go on a whole other segment about the deity of Jesus Christ uh, using scripture alone to be able to establish that in more ways than you would even. I could talk for probably 20 hours on that alone. But um, but we have we have this savior that, that bled and died. And, and there was a man on a cross that had two other men next to him. And, and one was mocking him and one was scoffing him. And the other one started out that way. But then something changed in that man's heart. And he began to realize that his own sin, he said, you know, I'm guilty. Like, we're guilty, right? We're, we're guilty of what we did. We deserve this punishment. But this man did nothing. 
And his words were this. This is so fascinating because people want to make this like this jump through 50 hoops to get to the Lord type thing, you know? And it's like, no, man puts those, it's like Pharisee, Sadducee stuff, right? This man looks at Jesus and said, remember me when you, when you get to your kingdom, right? And Jesus, what did he say? He's like, well, you got to go say 50,000 Hail Marys, you know? And then, you know, well, man, the guy's pinned a, a tree right? He's dying. It's like, what's he going to do? You know what I mean? It's like, what's his options at this point? Well, he, he, he recognized something real, that this man was different. And he believed that he was who he said he was, the savior of the world, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And Jesus's words was, I tell you today, you'll be with me in paradise. I don't know about you, but if I'm pinned to a tree and I've got some rusty nails uh, stuck into my hands and through my feet, and I have somebody saying that, who at the same time is, is in such a calm, collected, cool state, not throwing offenses at people, not putting curses down on people, but asking, saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I mean, I mean, that that even the even the guard during that that moment was amazing because he said, Surely this was the Son of God. <laughs> I mean, a murderous guard who's murdered, you know what I mean? Countless people, man. This guy's a professional slaughterer, you know what I'm saying? He just slaughters. Just what do you what's you know, his wife? What'd you do today, honey? I, I just crucified 27 people today, babe. All right, let's eat some tacos. You know what I mean? I mean, that was the guy's life, right? You know, but something happened, and I truly believe that what happened on that cross was he he's seen a man behaving differently than the rest and he's seen grace and he's seen forgiveness and he and he heard words spoken over humanity that have never in the history of humanity been spoken over humanity and that's our creator coming down and taking upon human flesh and walking amongst man and there's thou, there, there's there's hundreds of prophecies and thousands of passages of scripture to highlight this man's coming into this world prior to his existence as a human in this world when he took upon himself flesh as the fullness of God. And I think that that's a a message that this world really needs to hear right now because it's called good news, right? It's called good news. It's good news that you don't have to be a captive anymore. It's good news that somebody else paid the price. And Joe, I I get this a lot too. And I'm covering a lot of this stuff because the Lord just puts us on our, because I know a lot of these questions people ask and stuff they wrestle with. So I want to get it out there as much as possible. Um, You know, people ask me, how do you know Christianity is true? And I say, because it's free. It's free. And I think that's a very valid argument, man. When you look around humanity, everything's about a dollar. Everything's about fame. Everything's about fortune. Everything's about get my name here, put my name. There is no penny needed to come to Jesus Christ. And there's no penny needed to stay with him. And there's no penny needed to get to heaven. If it was man-made, it would be money-motivated and money-oriented. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is free. He said, come and drink freely of the water, not charging you a dime. So if you happen to go to a church and walk into a building and they start talking about, we need this from you or that from you or this from you, you turn around and you walk out of there just as faster than you walked in. Just walk out. <laughs> just walk out. You hear a pastor, and I always say this, Joe, you want to know a good pastor? He starts with the Bible, he stays with the Bible, and he finishes with the Bible. Not his camping stories, not his, what he did during the week. Now there's a much greater story and that's the story of Jesus Christ. And it's the story of humanity as told by scripture. So good, brother. Well, man, this was awesome. Um, we covered a lot and I will definitely have to have you back on. Cause I, I do have a feeling you could probably talk for 20 hours about all kinds of questions that we, uh, that we probably all kind of struggle with and need a little bit more clarity on, but yeah, the Noah part was awesome and I, my parents went up to the uh the one in kentucky uh last year you know did the whole rv thing when COVID was there and just went and traveled right. the country and went up to kentucky and just saw that you know 510 foot uh yeah. arc and yeah they said it was fascinating yep. and, and ken ham answers in genesis yeah yeah and spent, exactly. spent a day there and, and learned a lot there uh and just chatting with people and uh met some amazing people i would encourage you uh, if you're ever going through that area, stop by and see it. Yeah, see it. So, uh, well, man, dude, thank you so much again. What's um? I don't know if if you want to leave a way for someone to contact you if they have questions. Um, 
if well, someone's made I, it this far? Or? Yeah, I've had it. I just give them my. Uh, we'll put my email up there if you want to okay. put my email up there. It's cool. uh, b b b l a n k eighty one at gmail dot com. Um, that's that's probably the best way. Now I am so low tech, man. I am just literally like, I'm a low tech kind of redneck kind of guy. Um, I just I I didn't I had to quickly download the uh, the Zoom thing here. I don't this computer that I'm looking at, man. I mean, it's like a foreign object to me. You know, I I still do my books and I write out freehand a lot of my stuff. I've got stacks and stacks of paper. You know what I mean? I'm old school markers and and pencils and all that stuff. But but I I'm more than willing to if somebody does have you know some questions. I can't if I don't get back right away or whatever. Obviously, we all have lives and stuff. Please don't get offended. Oh, yeah. Um, I know that's something that that people can easily get offended. But I always say that it, it, it's it's in our heart to get back right away. But it's not always in the uh. There's, there's only 24 hours in a day, and we got to sleep. And there's other family members and people that we have to also prioritize and uh and take care of in our lives as well. Yep. So, man, appreciate you. And for all you listeners, I always give my email at the end, J-O-E at saltthrown.com, Joe at saltthrown.com. Same thing. I read every single one. Sometimes it takes me a while to get back, but love you guys. Uh, thank you so much, Brother Brant. Man, yeah, that was uh, that was awesome. And uh, if you guys have any questions, let us know. I, I put all the show notes in case you don't know this, because someone did ask recently, hey, where can I go see all the past ones? It's saltthrown.com forward slash unchurched so you'll see every awesome. single episode there and then below everyone you see a place you can put comments in or to shoot me an email it seems a lot of people have specific questions they don't want it there publicly understand so everything that comes absolutely to me is 100 percent confidential so guys it thank you that again. way oh yes <laughs> absolutely so thank you again and uh, we'll talk to you on the next episode we out awesome peace love you guys Cause it's in my soul.